Good morning. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church, back in the book of Genesis, picking it up, chapter 11, verse 10 today. In our last study, remember what happened at the beginning of our study. We had Noah. He, he was drinking of the wine, drank a little bit too much. He got drunk and passed out. And then his own son, Ham, went into Noah's wife and laid with her, had that incestuous affair. But remember, the law was not set forth against that yet, but Noah sure had a big problem with it. Noah said, curse be Canaan, he's going to be a servant to everybody. So be real careful. And Noah was a very righteous man, but he did make that mistake. And even one mistake can be, it can turn out real bad. So you want to be real careful when you're partaking of the wine. It says in Timothy, just take a little bit of the wine, but you be real, real careful. And then we came to chapter 11 where the Tower of Babel was built. Where you had people that they decided that they wanted to make themselves a name. And remember, the flood of Noah had just happened. So they were trying to build a tower all the way up to heaven. Trying to make their own salvation. To separate themselves from God. They think, we're going to be just fine. We don't need God. But you're always going to go in the way of destruction if you do that. We went and we read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. Where it says, if you want to go the way of wickedness, God will even send you strong delusion so that you believe a lie. So yeah, you want to go that way, God will let you. But then that tower, like I said, it would be called Babel. And you know that Babel means confusion. And when you ever you try to go away from God, that's all you're going to have is confusion. And you see, before that, everyone of the world was of one language. But at that time when they did that, God said, let's go down, let's confound their language. And then there was about seven different base languages, and that's basically the seven main languages of today, and all of the others are dialects of those seven main languages. But it brought confusion, and that's what happens when you go against God. So we're picking it up in chapter 11, verse 10. Let's ask the word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word, and we thank you for giving us this building. We can come and teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. Okay, book of Genesis in the beginning, chapter 11, verse 10. Now this is the generations of Shem. This is going to be the, the genealogy of through which our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, would come. And remember, we said in our last study, we're not going to skip these genealogies. We're going to read them. And you don't ever want to skip over any part of God's Word. Every single verse was put there for a reason. And there's much wisdom to get out of it. So it is very important. So we're going to cover this genealogy of Shem. So Genesis chapter 11, verse 10. And it reads, These are the generations of Shem. Shem was a hundred years old and begat our facts at two years after the flood. And I will say you can also read of this genealogy in Luke chapter 3 and 1 Chronicles chapter 1. There's always a second witness and you have three witnesses of the seed line of Christ. Verse 11. And Shem lived after he begot Arphaxad 500 years and begat sons and daughters. And Arphaxad lived 5 and 30 years and begat Salah. Salah, you can hear it, that's the, the very end of the name Methuselah. And remember it means a dart or a spear. And Arphaxad lived after he begat Salah 403 years and begat sons and daughters. And Salah lived 30 years and begat Eber. And Salah lived after he begat Eber 403 years and begat sons and daughters. And Eber lived 430 years and begat Peleg. Remember Peleg, that's division, the inheritance being divided. Verse 17. And Eber lived after he begat Peleg 430 years. And begat sons and daughters. Now that 430 years, that should make your ears perk up. Because like you read in the book of Exodus chapter 12 verse 40, it says how the Israelites sojourned 430 years. And that's from the time that the promise was given to Abraham, which is what we're about to read in this very study. So that's how long from the promise that the Israelites sojourned. And that that's just, maybe that's a coincidence here, but maybe it isn't. But no matter what, God wants that, our mind to be triggered to that, because that is written. Verse 18. And Pele lived 30 years and begat Ruth. 
And Pele lived after he begot Ru 209 years and begat sons and daughters. That word, that name Ru means a friend. Verse 20. And Ru lived two and thirty years and begat Saru. Saru, that word in the Hebrew means the branch. And like I mentioned, this is through which our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would come. And Christ is called the branch in Jeremiah 23 and Zechariah chapter 3 and other places. Verse 21. And Ru lived after he begot Saru 207 years and begat sons and daughters. And Saru lived 30 years and begat Nahor. And Saru lived after he begat Nahor 200 years and begat sons and daughters. This Nahor, this is Abraham's grandfather, but we're going to see in a minute that Abraham also has a brother named Nahor. So, got to be able to keep that straight. Verse 24. And Nahor lived 9 and 20 years and begat Terah. Notice that, that they're... As this is going along, they're, they're having kids younger and younger. Verse 25, And Nahor lived after he begat Terah 119 years and begat sons and daughters. Now, you know what you learn about Terah? This is Abraham's father. You know what you learn about him in Joshua chapter 24, verse 2? That he was an idolater. He served other gods. But that didn't stop Abraham from serving the true God, did it? So don't let any other factors keep you from serving the true God. You are your own person. Everyone's responsible for themselves. Verse 26. And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now Abram, this is Abraham. And you, his name was Abram at this time, which means high father. But his name would later be changed to Abraham, that letter H being added. And Abraham means the father of many nations. Not because he was actually the father of many nations, but because through Abraham's seed would come the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why Abraham would be a blessing to all nations if they serve Christ. Verse 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abraham and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. That means that's a, and her name will later be changed to Sarah. Sarai means my princess, but Sarah just means princess, and she is that princess of Israel. And the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. Verse 30. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. 31. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Aaron his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Aaron and dwelt there. God, Almighty God was leading them. Even though Terah was an idolater, that doesn't stop God's plan from coming to pass exactly how he wants it to. So God's guiding them. They're going into the land of Canaan. Oh, ultimately, they're going to make a stop. Verse 32. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And where were they at? They were in Babylon. That's where Ur is. God's saying, Get out of Babylon. Get out of confusion. Don't follow the idolatry ways of your fathers, but you follow me, is what our father is saying to him. And you, you read in, in Hebrews chapter 11, that beautiful faith chapter, how it says, by faith Abraham obeyed exactly what God wanted. And Abraham didn't even really know where he was going, it says there. But he followed because he did have that perfect faith in Almighty God, as we all must have. No such thing as halfway faith or 99% faith. You either truly believe in our Heavenly Father or you don't. Verse 2. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Once again, through him would come the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is a blessing to whomsoever will. Verse 3. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed, once again, because of the Savior, Jesus Christ. But understand, that's how it is for the elect. Someone comes against you, God's going to make sure that they get corrected for it. 
But if someone is, is good to you, blesses you, then God is going to bless them. And that's how it is for all those who truly love God. God protects and takes care of his own. And then he will he will destroy your enemies if they don't get the chain, if they don't get the idea the first time. So God takes care of his own. Verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Abraham did exactly what God told him to do because he had faith. And Lot went with him, and Abram was 70 and 5 years old when he was departed out of Haran. Now, it's so awesome because you learn later in the 17th chapter that Abraham does not get circumcised until he's 99 years old, 24 years after this. And that's when that, that law would come forth that the that Israelites were to be circumcised on the eighth day. But we know that when Christ died on the cross, that was done away with for religious purposes. But why it's so great that Abraham was already given this promise of the covenant 24 years before that. That's showing us that it's not only for the, those who are circumcised or those of Israel. But the love of Jesus Christ and eternal life is for whomsoever will. So, so like I said, circumcision is now of the horror as it's written. But it's not only for Israel, but it's for all people. If you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you will live forever. Verse 5. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls or the servants that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. They obeyed God. And also what it says in that Hebrews chapter 11, it, it says about how Abraham, he, he didn't really care so much about a, a geographical location, about a land. But what Abraham, what he sought after was that heavenly dwelling. Just to return back to our Father. That was what he cared about, was getting to heaven, living eternally. And that's what we all strive for. And it even says in, in Hebrews 11 that Abraham, he knew that he was just a stranger and a pilgrim on the earth in the flesh. He knew that it was just but a very short time that we're in the flesh. So what he strove for was to be with the Father. And you see, he didn't even get to see the, the fulfillment of the promise. But he knew it was true, and he followed God exactly as God led him to do. Verse 6, a very important verse <coughs> right here. And Abram passed through the land under the place of Sikkim. Sikkim, this is also known as Sychar in John chapter 4. And this is where Jesus Christ would convert the Samaritan woman at the well, same place, unto the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. Now, many people would just read over that without even giving it a second thought. But we're going to document from God's word that this and the Canaanite is in the land means a whole lot more than just the Canaanites. Now we know that Canaan, that is of the offspring of, of Adam, of Noah, or not of Noah actually, but of Ham. But so that is the Adamic people. But let's what this is that when it says the Canaanite was in the land, is speaking of those who had mixed with the second influx of the Nephilim. These are the giants. These are the, these are the ones who had mixed with the fallen angels. Do you remember when we read in Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 where it says the sons of God came to, to seduce women? And also after that, meaning also after the flood, God destroyed all the, all the giants in the flood. But then there was a second influx. The fallen angels came back. Remember, why is Satan doing this? Just like he's why did he seduce Eve in the garden in Genesis chapter 3? God's trying, or I mean Satan's trying to destroy the seed line through which Christ would come. The same reason is why Satan sent the fallen angels to destroy, to try to destroy the seed line. That's why they seduced the daughters of Adam. And right here, as soon as God gives the promise to Abraham that that he among him would many nations be blessed, meaning through him the Christ child would come. Satan's already at work. He sent his fallen angels back again, put them in the land of Canaan, so that he would, so that the fallen angels would mix with all those people. You see, it's not just the Canaanites, but it's the Canaanites who mix with the fallen angels. And many might say, "Oh, you're reading a whole lot into that." No, don't worry. Let's document it directly from God's word, because you're right. You can't get that from just that verse. But when you just when you study God's word as a whole, it all comes together. But turn with me to the book of Judges, chapter one. So we can document it exactly what this means. And the Canaanite was then in the land. Judges chapter 1, we're going to pick it up, verse 10. 
Judges chapter 1, verse 10, and it reads, And Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron before was Kerjath Arba. Kerjath means city, and Arba is one, of the, is one of the main giants like you read in the book of Joshua. And they slew Shishai and Ahimon and Talmai. Now those like you read in Joshua chapter 14, verse 15, those are the sons of Anak. Anak was one of the giants, one of the offspring of the fallen angels and the daughters of Adam. So these are the giants, these are the Geber. Now to document that, again, turn with me to, to verse 20 of this same book. Judges chapter 1, verse 20. And they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses said, and he expelled thence the three sons of Anak. That's those three sons we just read in verse 10. Anak is the giants, those who had intermixed, the offspring of those who had intermixed with the fallen angels. And like, like you read in the book of Samuel, I believe it's 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 20, if I'm not mistaken. Some of them, they had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each feet. Not God's natural creation at all. And it was all part of Satan's plan to try to ruin that seed line. Let's take this just one step further to document it again. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 20. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 20 is God's instructions to the Israelites on when they're to go to war. We're going to pick it up in about verse 16, but I want to read verse 1 because it's just such a great verse. So Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots, and a people more than thou, be not thou afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. God's saying, it doesn't matter if you're outnumbered, you remember how it was with Gideon in, the, in Judges chapter 6 and 7? They were outnumbered thousands and thousands to 300. They still came out victorious because God was with them. But I just wanted to read that so you know there's nothing to ever fear if God's on your side. But okay, now skip down with me to verse 16. What God is saying in, in these first 15 verses, He's saying if you go to make war with the nation, you give them the opportunity to make peace first. Don't just go destroy them. You give them a chance. If they want to surrender, then you let them surrender. But then it goes on to say, if they don't surrender, kill all the men, but don't kill the women and the children. Of course, that's the, that's the right thing to do. But now we come to a different people in verse 16. Let's read it. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 16. But of the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, Thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth. He said, you kill every last one of them, the men, the women, and the children. And remember, what's the land for the inheritance? The land of Canaan, where the Canaanites are. But it's not just the Canaanites that intermix with the fallen angels. That's why God said, you kill every last one of them. Verse 17, but thou shalt utterly destroy them. Namely, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. As the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Now you see, all of those, since we did study the genealogies, which is very important, we know all of those, except for the Perizzites, are the, are the offspring of Adam. So if you are aware that they intermix with the fallen angels, that, that this wouldn't make sense to you. And many people struggle with it. Why did God say to go kill all the Canaanites? Because they intermix with the fallen angels. Let's go another verse. One more verse here. Verse 18. That they teach you not to do after all their abominations which they have done unto their gods. So should you sin against the Lord your God. The fallen angels, all they did was teach perversion, wickedness, and the people fell right into it. Just wanted to be a part of something supernatural. What have we learned in this first about ten chapters, especially the first six chapters of Genesis? The fallen angels are coming back. So make no mistake, this is very important for us to understand. But when they come back, their main goal isn't to destroy a seed line, but it's to bring is to deceive you into worshiping that false one. But we had to cover that so you know it. Let's go back to the book of Genesis. So we know what that means that the Canaanite was in the land. Not just the Canaanites, the sons of Adam, but those one who had intermixed with the fallen angels. Satan got on top of it real quick trying to destroy that seed line, but of course he was never victorious and he never will be victorious of, of anything. Okay, back to Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. 
And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Almighty God, he, he appeared right there to Abram. Now, what was the first thing that Abram did when he received that promise? He prayed to the Father, built an altar so he could worship him. That's what you always want to do. We do not build altars today because what happened when Jesus Christ died on the cross and resurrected, that veil was rent from top to bottom to where you don't need a, a go-between. You can just pray to our Heavenly Father any day, any time, anywhere. But when God gives you a promise, when He blesses you, you thank Him for it. Don't only go to Him in the hard times, but you go to Him early and often and you thank Him for the blessings and the promises that He's given to us. And Abraham always did. Verse 8. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, and Hayar on the east. Now Bethel, if that were to be translated, it means the house of God. But Hayar, it means a heap of ruin. So you can kind of let me know you can go one or two ways. You can follow God, or you can just become a heap, a waste. And there he built an altar unto the Lord. And called upon the name of the Lord as he always did. I mean, every important step in your life, you always want to go to our Father in prayer. That doesn't mean you want to ask him what you should eat for breakfast in the morning. You, we, he gave us a brain. We can handle simple things. But if it's an important situation, a difficult decision in your life, always go to the Father in prayer. Always worship him. And you will be extremely blessed. Verse 8. We got that. Verse 9. And Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south, always following God's instructions. Verse 10. And there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. You get down to Egypt, you got the Nile there, you got plenty of water. So God leading Abram to where he's going to be just fine. Verse 11. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. I mean, she was very beautiful. 12. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife. And they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Abraham said, As soon as they see how beautiful you are, they're going to kill me and take you for themselves. It's very interesting. We have almost an identical situation to this. It will come up in... Genesis chapter 26 with, with Isaac and, and his wife, Rebekah. Verse 13. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And you see, this isn't even a lie like you, we really already learned it, but it's really spelled out in Genesis chapter 20, verse 12, that Abraham and Sarah, they are half brother and sister. You see, the, there was no law against incest at this time because there were so few people. I mean, it, it, was, it was no sin for that to happen. It, it would only become later that God would put in the law of incest. But there were so few people at this time that, that there was no law against that. But so it's not even going to be a lie. But you see, Abraham, he, he, God has given him wisdom. Always be wiser than the serpent to be delivered from your enemies. Abraham knows if they think that Sarah's his sister, they'll be real nice to Abraham. I mean, they'll do anything to get Sarah on their good side. So very wise. And it was Almighty God that put this in Abraham's head. And what this also lets us know is how much Abraham trusts Sarah. And you read in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 6, how she was very, very loyal to Abraham. And that's how all marriages should be. With complete trust. Remember what we learned in the, back in the book of Genesis chapter 2. That you become one flesh when you get married. Verse 14. And it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman, that she was very fair, very beautiful. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the, women, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. They were bringing her in to be a part of the harem. I mean, they saw her one instant. They brought her in. Verse 16, and he, entreated Aram, and he entreated Abram well for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. God just blessing Abraham, his, his cup flowing over right here. God used this situation to bless Abram so, the, so his people could be blessed. Verse 17, and the Lord plagued Pharaoh. 
and his house with great plague because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Now that, those plagues, that was probably boils if you, if you look up what the word plagues means in the Hebrew. But you see, no doubt that Pharaoh and, and his, they weren't following the true God. I mean, there's really no doubt about that. But what we're about to see is that even the heathen know when the true God, Yahweh, is in control. And when he, when he does something, they, they know it. I mean, that's you see that many times in God's word. Even the idolaters, they, knew, they know when the presence of the true God comes down. Verse 18. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? And we're going to have also almost the exact same situation come up again in Genesis chapter 20, only with the different people. But you see, you read in Genesis chapter 20 that Almighty God, he came to the leader in a dream, and God told him in the dream that, look, that's his wife. So this happens two times, almost the exact same situation. Verse 19. Why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore behold thy wife and take her and go thy way. But, but he never did lie with Sarah just like the leader in Genesis chapter 20 did it. That seed line remained pure. Verse 20. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. And they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Don't forget. Now Abram's got, Abram already had, he was already rich. But now he's, he's rich, rich, because God is blessing him, and it is no sin to be rich if you are blessed by Almighty God. So God used this situation to bless our people. Verse 13, go, or let's go right into chapter 13, verse 1. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Like I said, that's no sin. God blessed him. So if you are blessed by God, don't ever apologize for it. Verse 3. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and, ha and Hai. Famine's over, going back to where he had set that altar up. Verse 4. Unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Once again, every serious move that Abraham is about to make, he calls on the name of God to ask for wisdom, to ask for guidance, and we should always do the exact same. Like I said, you don't have to build an altar. Just go to him in prayer. Just talk to him. Verse 5. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was, was great. So they could not dwell together. I mean, they were so blessed. They had so many animals to take care of. There wasn't even enough grazing land for them to be right there together. Verse 7. And there was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. Now, watch how Abram's going to handle this. As soon as there was strife, Abraham puts a stop to it instantly. And that's what we always must do. I mean, if you let strife get built up in your family, I mean, that can destroy you. It even says in the book of Proverbs, it says that it is a great honor for man to cease from strife. When you see, when you see strife begin to creep in, just nip it in the bud right away. It will, strife will destroy a family, it will destroy a ministry. So you get rid of it instantly, and that's exactly what Abram's going to do. Continuing in verse 7. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwell then in the land. And you know exactly what that means. And notice that, that these are the ones that mix with the fallen angels. But also the Perezite, we covered the genealogies. Perezite, that was not in the genealogy of Adam. You know, this is those some, some different peoples, those who were created on Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, that God loved, that he said was very good. But he doesn't love these now because they intermix with the fallen angels. And like I said, in Genesis chapter 6, God, the way that God destroyed them was with the flood. But the way that the God planned to destroy them with the second influx, the offspring of the fallen angels, was with the sword of Israel. But if we would have kept reading on in Judges chapter 1, they're not going to follow God's plan. They're not going to follow His instructions. And that's very unfortunate. But you know what this means. The Canaanite and the Perizzite was in the land. 
those giants, the Geber, those who had intermixed with the fallen angels. And we're going to even learn in chapter 15 that the Kenites are there also. So just pure wickedness, just running wild. But is that going to stop Abraham from being righteous? That, it, that he had an idolatrous father, that he was in the middle of all this? Didn't stop Abraham one bit, so there's no excuse. Don't ever try to blame your surroundings for... Be responsible for your own self, as Abraham was. Verse 8. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Like, like I said, you get rid of any strife right away. He's saying, we're family. Remember, Lot is Abraham's nephew, but we're family. Verse 9. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Abraham is telling Lot, look, you take whatever spot that you want. Well, how can Abraham be so confident? Because Abraham knows that God is going to bless him regardless. As long as you do what's right, you don't ever have anything to worry about. And I just thought of a verse as I was reading this, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Where it says that if you can't get along with somebody, even if it's your family, it says you separate yourself from them. It says don't count them as an enemy, but admonish them as a brother and do not enable people. Verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Now we have, we have Sodom and Gomorrah here. Sodom even means burning. Many, when they go that way of Sodom and Gomorrah today, they fall into that burning fever. And don't, don't forget, Satan sent the fallen angels down there. Very likely it was the fallen angels that taught Sodom and Gomorrah that perversion and wickedness. So they're really mixed up in it, and Lot's going to be right in the thick of it. We'll, we'll get really more into that in, in a later chapter. Chapter about chapter 19. Okay, verse 11. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelt, Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. And don't ever forget Isaiah chapter 5, verse 8, where it says, Woe to those who build house on the house. I mean, where you just got, I mean, just places where there's no room. It's just every inch you got, you got a place to live in, the, in, those, in those type of cities. I mean, that's why crime runs wild. Woe to those who build house on the house. Verse 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. I mean, that just means that they were just going in the way of pure moral depravity. Corruption, just going in the way of perversion and just pure wickedness. I mean, Satan was having his way. And did, did Lot know that was going on? Well, that, that's a good question. Verse 14. And the, Lord, and the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. God saying to Abram, Look all around you. About to say, this land is going to be yours. Verse 15. For all the land which thou seest to thee, will I give it, will, will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Verse 16. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. And that's truly how it is today. You know, so many people, they try to just want to put this in one little tribe of Judah. When they never read 1 Kings chapter 11, where it says the tribe of Judah and the ten northern tribes of Israel are separate. And the ten northern tribes of Israel were taken captive by the Assyrian in, in the book of Kings also. And you know from his history, historical documents like the, the, like the Assyrian tablets and other things, how the ten northern tribes of Israel went over the Caucasus Mountains and were called Caucasians and went to Europe, went to Canada, went to the United States. They dwell in the Christian nations of today. I mean, how many times have we mentioned in these first few chapters of Genesis, in Jerusalem, Jesus Christ is not even worshipped there. There are some of the tribe of Judah, that's the good figs, but you have the bad figs, the Kenites, who overrun Jerusalem. And people want to say, oh, that, that's all the tribe of Israel over there. They have no knowledge of, of who they are. 
That's why he says in Daniel and many other places, God says, because of they, my children went in the way of wickedness, I'm going to give them confusion of face, meaning they don't know who they are. But thank, thank God for the wisdom that he does give us to, to, that you do know. And it is such a blessing to know that the promise remains that they are as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand of the sea and as the dust of the earth. That blessing remains true as God's promises always do. Verse 17. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. And like I said, God's promises always come to pass. Remember Isaiah chapter 43 verse 26 where God says, Put me in remembrance of my promises so I can justify you. Verse 18 complete. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Once again, Time to take a little, a little new step, trying to go a new way in life. Not necessarily a new way, but like I said, just to take the next step. Go to the Lord. Every time, every new thing that was about to happen, Abraham prayed to the Father, went to Him. Like I've said multiple times already today, ask for wisdom, ask for guidance, and, and, and you will be blessed. You will be so overly blessed. And remember how Lot, he, he saw that land, how it was real good, but, and he said, I'll take it. And like I said, did he know about the perversion and wickedness? Well, we don't know if he knew or not. But I'll tell you this, to, it is, however fruitful a place may be, it's sure not worth it to be surrounded by wickedness and perversion. So don't ever forget that. But we have this beginning. I mean, how amazing is the book of Genesis? Open it up from the very beginning. To know who we are, to know how it all started, to know that Satan tried to walk, tried to destroy the seed line at every single turn, but he was never victorious. Why? Because God's on the throne. So always call upon our Heavenly Father and you will be so blessed. And like I've said many times through this book of Genesis already, it's impossible to understand the end if you don't understand the beginning. But when you open it up from Genesis chapter 1, the entire Bible makes sense when you read every single verse exactly as it's written. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and for the wisdom you give us. We thank you for eyes to see and ears to hear. We thank you for giving us this building. We can come and we can teach your word exactly as it's written. We ask you to continue to guide us with your Holy Spirit and give us wisdom and understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share it with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. This is recorded at Smyrna Christian Church, Kokomo, Indiana, by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.